Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm welcoming you to the stream. We're talking about arguments for God's existence. I did a stream with a guy named Dr. Chad McIntosh. Let me go ahead and pull him up on the screen here, which we've had some technical issues with his internet. So hopefully his internet stays clean throughout the entirety of the show. We'll see how it goes. If things, if, if worse comes to worse, it'll just be basically me and Ted for the, for the show today. But let me just give you some background on where the stream is coming from, why it's important. So Dr. Chad McIntosh and I did a stream where we laid out, it was like a four and a half hour marathon stream. It was, it was ridiculously long. So we laid out, or really Chad did all of this work, but he, he laid out 150 something arguments for the existence of God that have showed up in the peer reviewed literature over the centuries. So it was a whole lot of arguments. And at the end, we went through like, what does all of this mean? Can you add up all of these arguments together probabilistically? Does that mean that it's more likely or not that God exists? How do all of these arguments sort of work together? So those are the types of questions that we were addressing at the end. Some atheists made response videos to that. But then also we just, we know that Dr. Ted Poston, who's on with us, he's uh, right b beneath me. He, he's actually been on the channel before we did a Q&A uh, about a week and a half ago with him. And it was awesome. I highly recommend going checking that out. But he is like the cumulative case guy. So he's been working on this for, I think in our interview, you said it was like basically since uh, you were in grad school, you were, you've been thinking about these, these kinds of issues, independence, how do, uh, you know, when you add up all of these different pieces of evidence, how does it all work? So you're the cumulative case guy. And so Chad and I just thought it was a great idea to get all of us together to talk about what do we do with all of these arguments? Do they actually matter? There's a lot of people in the comments, a lot of atheists were saying, you know, you add up a whole bunch of zeros, then you're still going to wind up with zero. So no, we don't have any evidence. All of these arguments are weak. They're bad. They're terrible. So none of them add up to anything. You're not getting a higher probability that God exists just because you have a whole bunch of arguments. Then there's a the question of what about atheist arguments? There, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's pretty well known that there's a problem of evil for theists. And so how does that factor in? So anyway, those are the types of questions that we're talking about today on the show. So, uh, but we we're limited on time today. So instead of doing like a long introduction, um, we're just going to jump straight into the material. So I'm going to pass it over to Chad and Chad, why don't you take it away? Because you've got an outline for us today. Oh, and let me, uh, uh before I pass it over, uh, one thing that I'll mention is that I've got the outline for today's stream actually linked in the description of this video. So if you just open it up, hit the little arrow down, uh, you can click the link. It's a Google document and you can follow along the outline with us today. It's going to be a, a really, really fascinating show. I think you guys are going to get a lot out of it. So definitely uh, stay tuned to the very, very end of this one. So, all right, Chad, uh, where, where, how should we, uh, how should we, where should we go from sure. here? Well, I think the best way to begin would be to get the, the basics of Bayes' theorem in place that will set up a good understanding of what a likelihood ratio is. Uh, so Ted is the expert here, so uh, I, I think uh, I, I should just hand it over to him for, for, for him to set us up. Okay, okay. cool. Well, th thanks, guys. So it's important to get sort of the big picture here. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get uh, more clarity um, about how to assess the evidential power of a wide variety of considerations. And the cool thing is that um, Bayesianism and probability calculus provides a good tool for getting uh, greater clarification about how you assess the cumulative case or the cumulative evidential power of a large body of evidence. So what we're going to do is we'll just, I'll try to talk through this really, you know, rather quickly and, and try to keep it intuitive. Um, if you, the, uh, the first thing to note is probably just Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem, it's a theorem of the ca probability calculus. And what it says is it tells you the probability of a hypothesis or a theory given a piece of evidence. And what's cool about Bayes' theorem is it's a mathematical equation that relates what's called the posterior probability to three other quantities. And what we can do is we can um, we can actually just focus on two of those quantities, which I'll explain in a bit. But it relates them. It says that the probability of a hypothesis given a piece of evidence is equal to um, how likely that hypothesis is in itself. So this is its prior probability weighted, multiplied here, by the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis. 
So the probability of the evidence, given the hypothesis, just measures how likely it is that if the hypothesis were true, you would have that evidence. So for example, if you were uh, you had a um, urn that had an equal number of black balls and white balls, and you think, well, what's the probability that we select a black ball out of that urn um, at random? And that probability would be one half, right? Um, so this is called the likelihood. And underneath the in the denominator of Bayes' theorem, you have the uh, prior of the evidence. But uh, what's kind of cool, um, <laughs> what's what's actually really cool is that if you're comparing hypotheses, right, you can ignore the bottom factor. And what you can do is you can just compare what are known as the uh, likelihood ratios. So this is the rate, this is the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis and the, over the probability of the evidence given another hypothesis. And that will tell you whether or not it's more likely that you'd have that evidence given uh, the one hypothesis or the other. And the cool thing is you can just think about that, not in terms of like plugging in actual numbers, but in terms of like the relative sizes or the relative magnitudes between the two quantities, right? So we could say you might not, you know, be able to work out, you know, numbers rather quickly in your head, but you can think, you know, suppose we had an urn that had, you know, 90 black balls and, and 10, you know, white balls, and we had an urn that had 50 uh, white balls and 50 black balls. Um, is the likelihood ratio going to um, favor, right, the urn with more black balls or the urn with, you know, fewer black balls? And you think, well, if we're asking about selecting a black ball, it's clearly going to favor the one uh, with more black balls. And you can do this um, for generally, uh, in general, for theories. So you can say, all right, let's compare theism, for example, with naturalism. And does theism give more probability to us expecting a universe that is fine-tuned for life over naturalism. And it can be kind of difficult to come up with numbers here, but you can say, well, surely, right, given the nature of the theistic hypothesis that it it says, you know, there is a, um, a, a being, you know, of unlimited knowledge, power, and goodness, this being would want to bring about um, creatures uh, of finite knowledge and power. These creatures would need to live in, you know, uh, some sort of community where they can get at each other and this requires a stable world for the kinds of reasons that you know Swinburne and others give and so you can say well look that likelihood ratio favors uh, theism over naturalism and so what we can do with these um, with these big uh, cumulative case arguments is that we can just compare the relevant likelihood ratio and we can add those up under certain conditions Right. So we say one piece of evidence favors theism, another piece of evidence favors theism, another piece of evidence favors theism, then another piece of evidence favors naturalism strongly. Given um, a certain independence constraint, we can just add those up to get the cumulative force of all that evidence. So if you're interested in the details here, I would encourage you to go check out um, this book. It's um, two dozen or so arguments for God. Um, and at the end of that, I lay out um, the more details to the probability um, to, you know, to Bayes' theorem and how you use this stuff. So just one other quick note is the independence condition that I mentioned. And this is the condition that um, the, well, let's just think about it intuitively. Like if, if you have one witness to a crime and that witness tells another witness about that crime and then that witness um, tells a person about that crime. The second witness there, right, isn't independent because they're just getting their information from the first witness. Compare that to a situation where you have two witnesses that both see the crime, right? One will report it and another will report it. In that case, their testimonies are independent, right? And so in general, we can think whether evidence is dependent or independent, and the cool thing about likelihood ratios is that if the evidence is independent, then you can just add them together. So hopefully, you know, that's a good enough intro to uh, get going with the actual arguments. Chad, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, Ted, can you illustrate likelihood ratios using what's known as Royals case uh, as a gold standard of strong evidence? Sure. Um, so the, the original um, 
Royals case. So this comes from um, Royals book. I think I have it somewhere around here. Yeah, this comes from from whoops Royals book, uh, statistical evidence, a likelihood paradigm, paradigm. And so he wants to illustrate, you know, what you can do with a likelihood ratio. So suppose your likelihood ratio um, has a va numerical value of eight. And you think, well, what does that mean? That means in, in some sense or another, right, that um, the evidence strongly favors um, uh, the hypothesis in, um, in the numerator, right? So in order to get a, gri a grip on this, um, think about um, another urn case. You're selecting two urns. You're, there are two urns, and you're going to select a ball uh, from, from the two urns. In the first urn, it's all white balls. And in the second urn, it's an equal mixture of uh, black and white balls. Okay? Now, you don't know the urns are behind a screen, right? So you don't know which um, urn you're selecting from. But what you do learn is that three white balls have been selected. All right? And now you think, okay, well, um, it could be from either urn, right? It could be from the um, urn with the equal mixture of white balls. It could be... Uh, from the urn uh, that has all white balls. But intuitively, right, that evidence favors the all white urn hypothesis, right? And so what you can do is you can think, well, what's the probability of um, getting a white ball from urn one? This is the all white, that's, that's probability one. What's the probability of getting a white ball from the uh, urn two, which is the one that's equal? equally mixed, right, that's going to be 0.5, right? So that likelihood ratio favors, um, that likelihood ratio has a value of 2, right? Because it's 1 over uh, 1 half, and, uh, you know, you just, <laughs> that's 2. Um, uh, and since the evidence, the selection of the white balls are independent, so the probability, probability that you select white on the second draw isn't affected by the probability that you would select white on the first draw, right? So what that means is that um, um, you have three pieces of evidence, right, that are independent, all have a likelihood ratio of um, two, right? And so actually the, what you would do in this specific case, right, is the uh, way to represent the cumulative power right, of that evidence is to um, uh, multiply them together. So it'd be 2 times 2 times 2, which gives you a likelihood ratio of 8. Now, the reason um, for this case is just to say, okay, what do we do, you know, if we find out that our evidence has a likelihood ratio of, say, you know, um, 8, how powerful of evidence is that? You think, well, that's pretty powerful, right? The selection of three white balls uh, in this setup is pretty powerful evidence, right, that you've selected from the all-white uh, urn. And so what we can do is we can, um, we can use this case to um, think about um, other likelihood ratios. And we can think, okay, well, suppose we have a likelihood ratio of 100. What's, what does that look like in... Um, in Royal's case, in this urn case, how many uh, consecutive white balls would that be? And Chad very helpfully put together um, a um, Excel sheet where you can play around with the numbers and it will give you, um, given certain likelihood ratios, it will tell you how many white balls that's equal to. And what that does is just ground the intuitions about, okay, well, if we say something has a likelihood ratio of 100, what, what does that really mean? It's just a number. Right. And you can think, no, it, it means, you know, it's the equivalent of um, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like eight uh, white balls. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does help. And it, it's also helpful to note that using likelihood ratios, especially as sort of the gold standard of eight as being good evidence is routinely used in the medical literature. I didn't know this until my wife told me, uh, my wife's a doctor and, and she, you know, she's always reading these articles and she always consults 
the likelihood ratios for correctly diagnosing some disease or, or some condition. And so she uh, sent me a bunch of articles where, where likelihood ratios are discussed in diagnoses. And, and Ted, I think you had one about mammograms. Yeah. So um, I teach a class on medical reasoning. And, uh, you know, we, um, you know, just teach students how to, how to reason about um, uh, probabilities. Um, I wish I had, I had this, um, I can send um, you guys a handout later, maybe that you can link to in the comments or something where people can look at the case. Um, but it's a standard. Yeah, that's um, pretty easy to do. It's a standard case. I can, I can read you the case if I can just, let me see if I can pull, pull this up. Um, so here's this, here's just a standard, um, kind of medical reasoning problem. So you have a, a woman in her forties who selected, you know, from just general population of, you know, American, uh, women. And it used to be routine to screen women for breast cancer or, you know, in the, in their forties. Um, but the probability that, you know, just a woman, uh, in her forties has breast cancer is 1%. So it's, it's relatively low. Uh, probability in the population. And then we, what we want to do is figure out properties of the test, right? So the test has um, um, the power to detect breast cancer with 90% 90, 90 of the time. So if a woman um, has breast cancer, then the mammogram is going to show it 90% of the time. Now, what about the case where a woman doesn't have breast cancer? Well, then there's still a 10% chance, right, that the mammogram will be uh, positive, right? So that would be a false positive. Now, what's interesting about this is that if, uh, if you go and ask, um, uh, you know, um, actual doctors, you know, okay, well, suppose there's a woman who comes in for routine uh, screening in this case, right? And we know that, you know, the test is going to detect cancer 90% of the time, but it's going to get a false positive 10% of the time. She does test, um, positive, how likely it is, how likely is it that she has breast cancer? And overwhelmingly, medical professionals just get this wrong, right? They tend to think that it's overwhelmingly likely that the person has breast cancer when in fact it's not. Um, and one way, uh, the way I like to teach this to my students is actually to do it in terms of um, what are called frequency trees, right? So you imagine you just take like a population of 100 women Right. And you say, OK, out of, let's do a thousand, actually take a population of a thousand women and say, OK, well, how many out of that general population will have breast cancer? Well, if the one percent number is right, there's only going to be 10 right, that have breast cancer. There are going to be 990 that don't. And so, OK, well, out of the 10, how many are going to um, how many are going to test positive? Right. And you say, well, the test will detect uh, breast cancer 90 percent of the time. So nine right, of the 10 that actually have cancer will test positive. There'll be one person, right, who will have breast cancer and, and test negative, given the numbers, right? So then we think, all right, well, what's going on with the 990? Well, we have 990 women that don't have breast cancer. What's the probability that they still um, get a positive result? And since it's a 10% chance of a false positive, they're going to be 99 women that are going to receive a false positive. Right. And so then what you want to do is you want to think, OK, well, what's the probability that an individual does have breast cancer, given that it tests positive? And what you need to do is you need to look at the nine that test positive that are true positives and the ninety nine that test positive that are false positive. And that's going to give you the relevant ratio. Right. So uh, it turns out to be, you know, less than a tenth. So probability of one twelfth or nine over one hundred and eight that a person is going to test positive for ratio. Now, what's interesting about this kind of case is that um, the likelihood ratio here, right, is just the probability of a positive test given cancer over the probability of a positive test given that the individual doesn't have cancer, right? And so this is why medical professionals are really interested in looking at these ratios, right, because they can tell them, they'll tell them how powerful, right, the relevant test is. So in the case that I just gave, the mammogram case, the likelihood ratio is going to be 0.9 over 0.1 or 9, 
right? So what that indicates is that the test is pretty powerful, right? But um, just looking at the likelihood ratio alone uh, will um, can be misleading in terms of how, whether or not you infer, because you also need to take into consideration like the pre prevalence, right, of the disease or cancer in the population. So, so really, um, in order to um, sort of use, um, you know, the resources of Bayes' theorem to figure out, well, you know, is it likely, for example, right, that there's a God, you need to know two pieces of information. You need to know what the relevant likelihood ratios are, and then you need to know how plausible um, theism is. And I think if we have time towards the uh, end of our time, we'll talk about the plausibility stuff um, later. But um, right now, our focus is just on the likelihood ratios, understanding those, and then seeing how those can take um, really complicated judgments and turn them into relatively simple math. Yeah, I think that yeah, that's really helpful. And we'll, we'll talk about what are fair estimates for likelihood ratios for good arguments, weak arguments, decent arguments in a minute. But just as far as the arguments for theism go, um, you know, I've been keeping tabs on theistic arguments for uh, a long time now. And I've found that the best way to impose order on this vast literature of theistic arguments is to group them into two categories. Uh, traditional arguments on one side, and then we have non-traditional arguments on the other. And then we have uh, seven categories uh, of traditional arguments and then seven categories of non-traditional arguments. And so for traditional arguments, we have, of course, cosmological, ontological, design, moral, uh, miracles, and miracles, I, I just have in mind the historical claims to like say resurrection or fulfilled prophecy con and also contemporary miracle claims and reports. And then we have uh, six experiential arguments, arguments from religious experience, including near death experiences. And uh, we have pragmatic or, or prudential arguments uh, such as Pascal's wager. Now, before mentioning non-traditional arguments, I have a qu quick question for Ted and, and that's, and that's how, Ted, how do you see arguments from miracles as fitting into a cumulative case for theism? I think in the last stream, uh, you said that, you know, for example, the argument for the resurrection should be brought in only on the heels of a good case for theism. Um, but I'm not so sure about this. Uh, Sandra Menson, I think is her name, and then Tom Thomas Sullivan have this, this interesting book called The Agnostic Inquirer, where... They argue that this is this is a mistaken approach, they, and they give this example. Suppose we're trying to decide whether there's extraterrestrial intelligent beings out there, whether aliens exist. Uh, clearly, it's reasonable to examine signals from outer space to help settle that question. Um, and, and this is, in fact, what, what SETI does, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So examining potential communications from aliens helps us judge whether or not aliens exist. Likewise, examining potential communications from God, such as revelation claims, can help us judge whether God exists. And so by considering potential revelation claims, only after a case has been made for theism, they say that we could be ignoring the most important evidence for theism of all, uh, maybe even the best evidence for theism. So what, 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 do, you what do you take of, um, take of that, that suggestion? Uh, I'm very sympathetic to that uh, suggestion. Hopefully, you know, something I said isn't inconsistent uh, with that. So I, one one point to make is just, you know, the um, fairly straightforward po point is like, if uh, you already, you know, think you're rationally committed to there not being extraterrestrial life, right, then it's not going to be plausible, right, at all, right, uh, to, um, to look for signs. I mean, that... Um, it's just that, you know, that's not going to make any sense, right? So in a Bayesian framework, you say something like, look, if you have probability zero, right, that, you know, a hypothesis is, is true, right, then the probability is going to be zero given whatever evidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and another sort of point in the neighborhood is just, well, if it's really close to zero, right, um, 
then you're going to have the same sort of situation where, um, you know, it would have to be extremely powerful evidence in order to move you significantly from something that say, you know, um, you know, 10 to the negative, like 23 or something like that. Um, um, so, so the way I was thinking about it is that, um, you, you have to look at, of course, the miracle reports and, um, you know, see what the evidence favors. But the way I think about it is that unless um, you you already have a plausible hypothesis that there's a God, right, um, the evidence isn't going to be so overwhelming that it can't be interpreted in some other way. Uh, you know, it's just standard, you know, kind of, well, this is a misreport. We don't actually have the report about, you know, uh, what happened. You know, it's a myth. Uh, there's some other explanation for it and so on. Um, now I do Let me just throw, go ahead. I'll just throw this out there really quickly. So, uh, Tim McGrew and Liddy McGrew have an article that was published in the, uh, the Blackwell companion natural theology. The likelihood ratio that they arrive at that the resurrection happened is uh, 10 over 44 or 10 to the 44, <laughs> 10 to the 44. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to, 10 to the 44. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So, so they, I mean, and, and that's what they are. They don't even talk about the prior probability because they, they think that number is just so, so large that, I mean, mm. yeah, mm-hmm. you'd, you'd have to have some really, really good evidence that God doesn't exist in order. Right. So that, is that kind of your point, Chad? I guess so. I, I, I take it that their point in the, in the book, The Agnostic Inquirer, is just that it's a mistake to just, to, to rule out claims of revelation as belonging in the equation of evidence for God's existence, as if we should only consider those claims after we have a good case for theism, because those claims can be part of a good case for theism. Um, so yeah, yeah. Well, how, how you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you you know, I think I'm trying to remember, I was talking to someone about this. I can't remember if it was in the earlier stream that we did, but, um, Swinburne distinguishes between, um, evidence that makes a claim more probable than not, and evidence that increases the probability of the claim, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so you can have, you know, when when I say something like, well, theism needs to be plausible, right, um, in order to, um, you know, sort of get significant um, uh, confirmation from, from miracles and such, right? Um, I'm thinking in a way of the final step, right, the making it more probable than not. And I certainly think that you could start off with, you know, a relatively... Uh, low probability, definitely less than than 0.5, and then you add in uh, the miracle uh, reports, and that can raise the probability above 0.5. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So that yeah, that helps. So we have traditional arguments, and and then we have non-traditional arguments. So here we have metaphysical arguments, and these are arguments from abstract objects, the nature of unities. The applicability of mathematics. Uh, we have Joshua Rasmussen's uh, argument from limits and, and and arguments like these. Then we have nomological arguments, arguments from the laws of nature. And if you're interested in this argument, check out uh, a flashy new paper in in the journal Noose uh, that was just published defending this argument. Uh, we have noological arguments, arguments based on mind related phenomena such as consciousness, reason, and knowledge. We have axiological arguments which are arguments based on non-moral kinds of value. So these are distinct from moral arguments. Uh, and non-moral kinds of value would be uh, aesthetic value uh, or, or deontic value. We have linguistic arguments based on certain facts about language and semantics. We have anthropological arguments, such as the argument from desire, meaning, love, the consensus gentium argument, uh, the political argument. Uh, and we have uh, finally uh, just the broad category of meta arguments, and and here I would include transcendental arguments, and uh, Ted's uh, argument from so many arguments. Uh, another example would be uh, our dear late friend uh, Ben Arbor's argument that uh, we have so many ar- The fact that we have so many arguments for, the- for theism should raise our, raise our credence in the possibility premise of the ontological argument. Since an argument for the conclusion that God exists is an argument for the conclusion that God possibly exists. So having a lot of arguments for the conclusion that God exists is the same as having a lot of arguments for the conclusion that God possibly exists. Uh, Now, uh, another question for Ted is, um, 
do you think of the argument from so many arguments as its own distinct argument? Or is it just sort of a cheeky name for the for a cumulative case? Uh, <laughs> just sort of being uh, supervenient, as it were, on, on just all the are all the arguments. Yeah. Now I don't know how Planaga th thought of it originally when he introduced the term, right? So he has the argument from so many arguments. Like there's so many arguments, and so that's an argument. Um, I don't think of it as being a separate consideration, okay. right? Okay. That uh, raises probability theism. Yeah, so this is what Plantinga says. Of it's only it's only two lines. These arguments import a great deal of unity into the philosophic endeavor, and the idea of God helps with an astonishingly astonishingly wide variety of cases. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah there now there is a uh, there's a quote that I think I put in one of my recent papers from. Um, uh, let's see, was it? It was uh, I think the mathematician. Uh, Neumann, he says something like, you know, there has to be a God because it explains so much, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's here's a way I guess you might think of it as a distinct argument is, is that, uh, you know, if a grand theory is true, we would expect there to be multiple lines of evidence supporting it. So the fact that we do have multiple lines of evidence supporting theism is additional evidence for theism. Uh, do you think that's a, a way of thinking about how this could be a distinct argument? Uh, perhaps, um, you know, I'm a little worried about double counting kind of, you know, issues mm -hmm. is, is like, you know, if you do have multiple lines of independent evidence and it is pretty powerful, um, then uh, that you have multiple lines of evidence, right? And it's pretty powerful. Doesn't seem to me, uh, um, seems to me in a way unnecessary, but also, um, you know, seems like, you know, um, if I go to the bank and I say, hey, you know, um, how much money do I have in, in the account? And they're like, oh, yeah, you, you've got a couple hundred dollars. And I'm like, oh, well, let me just write myself a check for a couple hundred dollars more. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah. So it hey, kind of feels that way to me. Why gotcha. don't we turn to talk about the uh, the difference between a good argument and a bad argument? Because that's going to tie into the, the calculator that we're going to show in just, uh, I guess, a few minutes here. We're getting to it pretty quickly. So why don't yeah. we talk about that? Yeah, good. And, and the standards of good arguments are going to depend on the kind of arguments. So a good inductive argument, like Ted said, um, it, it's one that makes a hypothesis or the conclusion more probable, either more probable than it was before, uh, more probable than an alternative hypothesis, or more probable than not. Well, the standard for a good deductive argument is going to be different. It's got to be formally valid. Uh, the premises jointly into the conclusion. It has to commit no informal fallacies, and it has to have true or plausibly true premises. Now, it's very important to note that a sound argument is not necessarily a good argument. For example, here's a sound argument that's not a good argument. Either my cat is named Lucifer, or one plus one equals two. My cat is not named Lucifer. So one plus one equals two. That follows from the two premises by disjunctive syllogism. It's indisputably formally valid in first order logic, and the premises are true. Um, but it's not a good argument. Uh, you know, if you want an argument for thinking one plus one equals two, this is not going to move you. So mere soundness is not enough to make a good uh, an argument a good one. A good argument must have some other virtue or virtues that make it rational to believe the conclusion on the basis of the premises. Now, we don't have to do a deep dive into the philosophical literature on the nature of arguments. We just We just need this nice little heuristic that says that a good argument is one that's valid, commits no informal fallacies, and it's rational to believe the conclusion based on the premises. Now, it's important to bear these points in mind uh, generally about good arguments, but especially as we as we go on to talk about theistic arguments. Um, so, Cameron, if you want to pull up the, the calculator that we have. There we go. And uh, so we have this calculator. This is based on the math that Ted lays out in his uh, his paper. And I want to ask Ted, what do you think of what do you think of these likelihood ratio estimates for weak, decent, and 
strong arguments and decent is, is showing up as medium there. Um, obviously, you have to have something above just, you know, one point something in order for it to count as anything uh, or else it's just it's either neutral or, or anything less than that is no evidence at all. So mm -hmm. what do you think of those ranges there? I've just uh, kind of toyed with, with myself as being uh, valid ranges for weak, decent or medium and strong arguments. Yeah, that can work. I now, just a note, in the paper, I use log likelihood ratios as opposed right. to likelihood ratios. Are these just the straight likelihood ratios? These are the likelihood ratios, yeah. Okay, okay. So strong has a range of 3.1 to 8. Is that the idea? Yeah, because 8 was our uh, was our gold standard of good evidence. Draw, it's the equivalent of drawing three white balls yeah. from the urns, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's fine. I, I would, you know, um, maybe just put strong as eight and then medium as three okay. and, and weak as, uh, you know, close to one. <laughs> uh-huh, close to one. Yeah. Should I update these? If you want, I mean. So so uh, right now, just let me, you know, right now yeah. you have uh, strong evidence as likelihood ratio of 3.1 and medium as, so you're going with the lower ranges of the figures? Yeah, I'm just if if something exceeds a likelihood ratio of three, I think we're getting into the territory of a strong argument. Okay, uh, that's that's the way I was thinking of it. But of course, I mean, an another question here is, uh, I mean, how are we going to estimate likelihood ratios for arguments? Is it purely subjective? What What are your thoughts about that, Ted? No, I mean, I think this is actually a strength of the framework is that uh, intuition um, seems to be fairly stable. With thinking of the relative, uh, uh, the relative, um, well, thinking of the values of the ratios by thinking of how likely is a piece of evidence given theism, how likely is that piece of evidence given naturalism, and mm -hmm. you can say, okay, well, look, we can't uh, settle on a precise number for each, but we know, like, uh, it, you know, theism predicts this, you know, uh, many orders of magnitude greater, right, than naturalism, and so on, right. So I, I think that that's actually a case where. Um, um, it's a it's a nice sort of formal way of um, of, of develop, developing the the debate, right? To where we can say, hey, you know, we've made some headway on this. You know, we now agree that the evidence, you know, favors theism or favors naturalism, right? Uh, it, within this range, right? And just to give now, you an example, just to give you an example yeah. of this, like a lot of people. I mean, I think the consensus now in philosophy of religion is that uh, theism, given given the evidence of fine tuning. Right. That uh, is much more likely on theism than it is on single universe naturalism. Right. So that likelihood ratio is going to be incredibly uh, favorable to theism. So to give the listeners some sense of how these can have an, like an ampliative effect, uh, how, do you, how do you want to play with the numbers here, Ted? Uh, you know, 22 dozen or so weak arguments, medium strong arguments, strong arguments. Uh, how do you yeah. see the how do you see the landscape of theistic arguments in terms of strength? So uh, this is a nice uh, way to accommodate lots of different judgments, right? So you can say, all right, well, how many uh, theistic arguments do you think are plausible, right? Um, are you on board with you think cosmological argument, you know, the teleological argument, the moral argument, the argument from consciousness, right? Maybe that gives us four, you know, arguments. So suppose. Like you think, yeah, okay, those are the four, and they are pretty strong evidence for theism. So in that case, what you would do is you would, I mean, I would actually put the the strong, uh, well, I mean, I think three is um, for for a value um, in that case is is uh, a little modest, but you know, suppose you had um, four of those arguments, then you can just enter four into the Excel sheet, and it will tell you uh, what the total likelihood ratio is. And the equivalent number of, of white balls, right? And so the the you can see the total likelihood ratio there is you know ninety two, right? You think wow that's pretty powerful. Well go back and but then think you know this is just a number. What does it mean, right? Go back to the uh, urn case that I laid out at the beginning, and you think that's like selecting uh, you know just say somewhere between six and seven consecutive white balls, which seems over you know overwhelmingly very powerful evidence that you're selecting from urn one. 
right? And then you can uh, update this, you know, um, to find out, okay, well, if my starting probability um, of God is a half, right, then after we add in these four arguments that are, you know, uh, fairly strong arguments, even, at, you know, given what I said, the 3.1 is, is rel relatively modest, you end up with an overwhelming, you know, um, overwhelming, you know, posterior probability, right, of theism. And this is, you know, I, this is something I think I mentioned in an earlier stream. This is, you know, I, I find this stuff really fascinating because you start off with relatively modest assumptions and you end up with, uh, you know, thinking, wow, you know, <laughs> the the final probability in theism is 0.989. I mean, that's, that's overwhelmingly, uh, you know, uh, over, overwhelmingly probable. Right. One one thing that Cameron and I ran into when we played with these numbers before is that it's actually challenging to to get a cumulative case out of these arguments that doesn't end up with a total final probability of above 0.5 for God's existence. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. I mean, when you work through the details of the arguments and right, you think, all right, well, you know, I agree that this strong argument, I agree that's a strong argument, I agree that's a strong argument. It's very difficult to, you know, um, capture what I think, you know, if you asked, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I don't know if they say this publicly, but um, if you were to ask a lot of philosophers, like, how um, strong do you think the, the case is for theism? I mean, a lot of people are going to say there's just no case. It's relatively weak. Right. Um, but even, you know, among theists, they'll say, oh, you know, it's it's fairly strong it's not as strong as you know um you know we you might think but it'll, it will make something like you know um it plausible that there's a god and you know so on so maybe if you're thinking about this in probability it gets you somewhere in the middle range um, <clears throat> but when you actually plug in the numbers and work it out uh you know it's tough to uh avoid the conclusion that um, given the evidence you know the probability of, of theism is fairly high Another, yeah. another way to, yeah. <laughs> I was just say another way to kind of cool thing to think about this is think about the case for naturalism too, right? And you think, mm -hmm. you know, be even handed here and you think, okay, well, look, if these are the cases that uh, theists give, then, then let's think about the cases, right, that, um, you know, naturalists or atheists give, you know, and then we can model those as likelihood ratios too, and you can add them all in, right? You can, you can say, you know, suppose they're you know, four strong arguments for theism and there are, you know, two strong arguments for atheism. Well, that would be as if we had two arguments, two strong arguments, right? You just subtract them off and then you can just run your numbers and just see where you're at, right? So even even in that case, right, you know, you give, you know, you say, hey, you know, theism has um, four strong arguments, atheism, you know, maybe hiddenness and evil, right? What does that do to your... Um, final probability. And as Cameron just updated and shows, I mean, it moved you from, you know, 0.98 to 0.9, which yeah. is, uh, you know, I just think about the other 150 that we, we did in our stream. Yeah. Yeah. I get, you know, so, um, I think this is it's just, you know, I love this stuff. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to, uh, m you know, use to model, you know, judgments. Mm hmm. And, you know, I think for a lot of people looking at this calculator and, you know, and, and we're looking at a list of theistic arguments, say we have 150 here uh, with with varying degrees of strength. And then we have another we have we look at another list, a list of arguments for for naturalism. And I've seen some of these lists being, you know, uh, batted about on, on online, too. Um, now, I think it's going to come down to this starting probability of God's existence, right? This is going to be a huge controlling factor for uh, the total pro uh, probability that God exists. So, and, and this is where we, we transition to some of more, your more recent work, Ted, uh, on the intrinsic probability of grand explanatory theories. So would you tell us just a little bit about, uh, well, remind us what the intrinsic probability of a theory is, and then, and then tell us what's different about uh, when we consider the intrinsic probability of a grand explanatory theory. Yeah. So intrinsic probability is just another way of talking about prior probability, right? So in the, in the mammogram example, the prior probability that a woman uh, in her forties has breast cancer is uh, point, point zero 0.01, right? 1%. Um, 
When we talk about the intrinsic probability of a grand theory, you're talking about its probability prior to any evidence, right? So, um, you know, grand theory is a theory that explains the nature, uh, the existence and the nature of the universe, right? Um, there are several different grand, grand theories. Theism is one, you know, naturalism is another. Uh, and so you just think, okay, well, what is its probability prior to considering any evidence? And as you mentioned, I mean, a lot of people have different judgments about this. One of the one of the main lines um, that naturalists offer is, is something along the line of Russell's uh, teapot, right? Example is that the probability the probability of God is just overwhelmingly improbable. It's like you know positing right a teapot that is um, cer- somewhere in between right uh, the sun and Mercury. So this would be something that would be completely you know unobservable you know when Russell was writing this um, and um, you know completely implausible. Right. And if you think of the hypothesis of theism as the posit, you know, as as that example, right, you're going to think in a way it's ridiculous to look for evidence uh, for such thing because it's just so vastly improbable. And now you take issue when it comes to the question of determining the intrinsic probability of a theory. The usual way defended by Swinburne and others is by comparing uh the theories we have, a, you know, multiple theories comparing their degree of simplicity, um, and of course, this Swinburne is the is the simplicity guy. Uh, yeah. And and so, what what is your main contention with this way of determining intrinsic probability of a theory? That's a really good question. Um, so, I can give you a really long answer, or give you a short answer. I'll try to sort of. I need both. Give, <laughs> you need both. <laughs> What do you want to start with? So the short answer is that simplicity uh, is supposed to be a, a very special kind of virtue. So it's supposed to be kind of a logical objective property of theories, right? Um, it's not supposed to be a um, um, like a psychological judgment or heuristic value. It's not supposed to reflect something about you know human psychology. Um, and in virtue of it being kind of a logical objective feature of theories, right, you want to say, okay, well, you know, tell me about the logic of simplicity. And, you know, the problem is, is just that uh, no one has really offered a um, successful, you know, account of simplicity. Um, It seems much more akin to kind of a natural judgment, um, maybe reflecting, you know, like a heuristic virtue or or such. Um, Now, I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sort of open but cautious about simplicity. You know, I'm I'm fine. Yeah, with... Swinburne, you're, he's gonna fight you over that. He's gonna like literally. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We fight you. Out. Like, yeah, no, he's, he's so probably just... gonna send me a nasty email in, in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that you reject simplicity. This actually gets to a question I want to ask you in a minute. It's that well, um, but before that, can you put on the table for us your alternative for? Uh, alternative to simplicity for determining a theory's intrinsic probability. Yeah. So just just as a background note, um, some people have said this isn't an alternative to simplicity. This is just a different ah. way of thinking about yeah. simplicity. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, I just think that uh, explanation um, is uh, an, a very epistemically powerful way of coming to believe something that something explains. You know, a body of evidence, right, is very good. Um, you know, uh, reason to believe, right, that hypothesis. And when we are engaged in explanatory reasoning, we're very sensitive to uh, contingency judgments and things that lack, you know, deep structural explanations strike us as uh, very implausible. And so my, um, my idea is that we use these contingency judgments, right, to, in a way, um, uh, limit the space of plaus- limit the space of options that we're going to um, uh, give positive probability. So just to give an example, right? Suppose someone claimed that it's an ultimate fact of the universe that thirteen uh, demigods exist, right? And you think thirteen? Why not twelve? Why why fourteen? You know why not fourteen? You know. What kind of powers do they have? And they're like, yeah, well, there's one McArm guy and one McEar guy. And, you know, and you're just like, this is just absurd. 
like, you know, so at that point, you know, I just think, look, you know, that some people think, well, you know, it's a view, give it some pos positive probability. I'm saying, no, it, don't give it any probability, right? It's, it's not a contender. Um, and the, if you, if you buy that move, then, um, you get rid of, uh, one objection to, um, thinking about the intrinsic probability of grand theories. And that is that there's just an infinite number of them. Right. And if you give them all positive probability, it ends up that they have probability zero, right, on anything like a normalized measure. Um, and if they have, you know, and you, I mean, you could go infinitesimal, but then you, you're back into the same sort of problem that I've been worry, worrying about for a while is that um, if it's so close to zero, right, then um, the evidence, right, isn't going to um, do much, right, to uh, boost your final probability. So I really so the like way... the fact. Let me let, let me jump in here real, real quick, Chad. Mm -hmm. Don't lose your question. Uh, I'm yep. also really happy about the, uh, the your internet seems to be. I mean, there was one point where it was kind of going in and out, but it seems to be doing really well. So I'm really happy Good. about that. So uh, let me just let the audience. It, it's been actually. Uh, I'm I'm really surprised at how quickly we've moved through a lot of this material, and I've been watching the the live chat to see what you guys have to say about the the stream today. So there have been some objections that have come up, and we've kind of dealt with some of those. But if you have a question for either of my guests, either Dr. Uh, Chad McIntosh or Dr. Ted Poston, then uh, let me know in the live chat. We've also got a couple super chats we'll get to uh, as quickly as we can. But I do want to open it up to some questions. If you guys have questions, objections about like the way that we're doing this, a lot of people have been talking about the prior probability. We haven't talked enough about the prior, which we, d we did talk about it uh, fairly recently in, in, right before we started talking about, well, I guess we're, we're still talking about it. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to open it up to some Q&A and objections. If you've got some objections to uh, what we're talking about today, leave them in the live chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it. And uh, Chad, go ahead and ask your, your next question. Yeah, so the way you put this in your paper, Ted, is is uh, the best way or, or, or your preferred way of thinking about determining pri the prior probability of a grand explanatory theory is that it should posit as few uh, properties with finite limits as, as possible. So avoid brute limitations. Now, yeah. one question uh, very quickly I had about this is that... Uh, um, suppose you have two theories and they are equivalent with respect to the number of brute limits that they posit. And, and, and in, in, in your example, you know, the brute limit, uh, was 13 demigods, right? Uh, why 13, you know, and, and why do they have the powers that they do? That seems to be like a brute limit that's, that's unexplained. That makes the theory ad hoc and, and, and so forth. So, but suppose we have two theories that are equivalent with respect to, to the number of brute limits that they have. Um, and so they're equally intrinsically probable, but now suppose that one of those theories is simpler than the other. Um, does that change the probability comparison for you? Yeah. I'd want to hear, uh, a specific case. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, Swinburne, for example, uses a criterion of simplicity, closeness to observation. And I think that that's not a, I think that's more of a heuristic virtue. Um, then, you know, some, some sort of, you know, feature of a theory that would matter for its intrinsic mm -hmm. probability. Right. Um, I do think there is a fairly good mapping from, uh, leaving, um, few unanswered questions, uh, to the kinds of issues that advocates of simplicity talk about. And so it, it may be that, um, really where that debate will go down is just, you know, um, is that, is this, uh, explanatory feature? Right. Um, if not, is it some extra feature of, you know, um, you know, of simplicity, you know, Swinburne thinks, for example, that, you know, the function, um, you know, f of x equals x, right, is simpler than the function, you know, f of x equals x squared. Right. And um, I mean, I, you know, uh, I don't see that, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, if there's a if there's a possible case. And, you know, it might boil that boil down to details uh, of a case where there's brute limits tie and the tie is broken by simplicity. And if there's cases where there's a simplicity tie that's broken by brute limits, uh, would that imply that neither way of determining in the prior probability is superior to the other? Yeah, I mean, I'd really just have to look at the details, you see know, the the cases, case, yeah. see, see how that so, works out. It's hard to answer, you know, in the abstract. 
in the abstract. So yeah. in the paper, though, you talk about three big theories, three grand explanatory theories. So uh, it's theism, naturalism or atheism, and axiarchism. Uh, yeah. So what what are these theories and, and uh, how are we going to compare them? Yeah, so... Um... You know, like I said at the beginning, like one of the one of the objections to theism is that it's just completely implausible, right? And I think, okay, well, if we're thinking about you know uh, assessing prior probabilities on the basis of you know how many unanswered questions does theory have, we can get rid of a lot of crazy theories, you know, a lot of um, theories that people have held, you know, um, over the years using that criteria. And so, uh, what I end up arguing for the paper is that um, there are three. <laughs> Uh, grand explanatory theories that you're going to give um, equal probability. Theism, it's the hypothesis that there is um, one being of pure limitless intentional power, right? So intentional power is the one property held without a limit. Um, there's naturalism. Naturalism, um, as I interpreted in the paper, in its most plausible version, is committed to something like a um, principle of plenitude, where um, every uh, contingent possibility is realized in some world or other. So this form of naturalism would be, you know, committed to something like a, you know, an infinite, you know, multiverse. Um, and then axiarchism, which is uh, defended um, by Derek Parfit in a paper. And its basic idea is that uh, reality is fundamentally normative, right? There's a principle of goodness, right? And things exist because they are good. Um, I find in, in, in the paper I talk that that this fits with um, certain forms of like impersonal uh, Hinduism that talks of the Brahman as like a creative force. Uh, but all of those views uh, have uh, the feature that I think they have, they leave uh, few unanswered questions relative to, you know, what is some, some of the other views would be. So for example, single universe athe atheism or single universe naturalism, right, uh, posits a single existing eternal universe but it doesn't right this universe has really unique properties and it doesn't explain um you know where those properties came from right so i think well that's a that's a weakness of the view um, so i'm i was actually surprised that you brought up axiarchism uh not because of its explanatory virtues because it is a very explanatorily uh, virtuous view because if it's true, literally nothing goes unexplained. Um, uh, John Leslie is probably one of the biggest proponents of the view, and, and he says, uh, uh, if we expl explain everything that exists because there's a fundamental being that gave rise to it, uh, what explains the fundamental being is that it exists because it ought to exist. Uh, and so literally nothing goes unexplained on this view, which is, which is very attractive. Um, but <laughs> even though it is gaining in popularity, it seems to suffer from a pretty devastating objection. You know, the, the main principle that, well, X exists because it ought to exist seems, seems circular since something has the property of oughting to exist only after it exists, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's like it's deontic status is logically posterior to, its existence so it's it's a bootstrapping type worry where the thing gets pulled up into existence by this property that it can have only after existing so if we can eliminate axiarchism on the because uh if, if it's if it's viciously circular if it, if it does have have this bootstrapping problem then its prior probability is zero so now we're just thinking about theism and naturalism yeah, no, that, that's right. I mean, you can go, you know, whichever way you want to go on these things. I mean, I think in the case, you know, in the overall cumulative case, it's really not going to matter. Um, so once you actually look at the evidence, right, as long as you start off with, uh, you know, the theism having, you know, a modest probability, you know, non-infinitesimally, you know, small, um, then the evidence is going to matter, right? And um, I mean, that's the overall strategy in the paper. So, yeah. So I'm... You know, I'm very, you know, open to, you know, very friendly to say, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a framework, right? And as long as you agree to, you know, the the general, um, you know, the substantive, you know, uh, conclusions that I'm drawing for this framework, there's a lot of leeway, 
on different options and you're all going to end up in the same spot. So right. theism. Do, Chad, yeah, do you mind on. if we move to this, uh, the q and I want to make sure that we get through as many of these as possible. Uh, can I ask this one last question? And yeah, I yeah. was going to say, let's, let's get to some questions, some other questions is, uh, I was going to just say that theism, uh, is a broad camp and that, uh, 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 we got to consider the vast difference between even something like a Unitarian theism that sees God as one person and Trinitarian theism, which sees God as, as three persons. So my question is how, how would the doctrine of the Trinity play in here? Uh, I know it's hard. Uh, I mean, would Trinity constitute a, a brute limit on, on your view, a brute finite limit? You know, why three persons isn't one better or why not an infinite number of persons? Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, does Islam beat Christianity in the uh, intrinsic probability battle here? Yeah, so Swinburne actually has a uh, argument where he thinks that uh, a being of pure limitless intentional power implies that they're going to be three persons, right? So uh, a being of pure limitless int pa uh, intentional power is going to be a being of pure love, right? Love um, gives of itself, loves uh, to, to be fully manifest requires uh, co-equals. And he, he argues that uh, this requires the existence of another person and perfect love is realized when uh, two people share their love to bring about right a third uh, person like a mini family, right? And so he argues that um, on philosophical considerations, right, alone that um, uh, being a pure limitless intentional power implies the doctrine of the Trinity now, that's his argument. I mean, I don't know what I think about that argument. Um, uh, it, uh, um, you know, in, in the future, I think it'd be fun to, you know, work more on that specific issue, um, you know. But, yeah, no, that I've, that's an issue. I mean, you know. I've got I something to say that, about that. that. Okay. Well, so I, I follow Josh Rasmussen. I mean, he and I are friends, and we, mm -hmm. we talk all the time. This, this is something that's come up in... Uh, the, the argument for the Kalam that I've gotten that I've given in the my debate with rationality rules. He's an atheist on on YouTube. Uh, one of the arguments that I gave in that that debate was the argument from limits. And so he didn't bring this objection up, but it's come up in uh, from from other people. It's like on the Christian conception of God, you've got this Trinity, but that seems like an arbitrary limit. Three persons, like what explains that? So uh, Josh's response to that is that not necessarily because I think Swinburne is making a sort of stronger claim that just the concept of God entails or implies or makes probable that there were, would be these three persons or that the Trinity would, would follow. But I don't, th I don't think that's necessary. I think you could just hold that, uh, though that property being the Trinity is, uh, it has some kind of explanation has a deeper explanation. So it's not a, it's not a fundamental property in the sense of being like an unexplained property. So it could just be that any perfect being is going to have, you know, be at least a Trinity or some, something like that. So it's not, it's not that it makes it probable, but it's that it explains why it's the case. So I think that yeah. that could be uh, one, one option, one way that someone could go. Yeah. yeah not, yeah. not to self promote, but this is exactly the topic I wrote on uh, for my dissertation where I argued that the only way to have a self explanatory being is if it has three parts of which of course uh, dovetails nicely into a doctrine of the Trinity. So oh, that's yeah. Awesome. Okay, so let's get to some questions. We have we've had a, a bunch come in, so let's get to uh, as many as we can. So first of all, this is just a really nice comment from Brute Facts Podcast. He says, uh, "Fantastic conversation, great matchup, Cameron." So that's cool. I'm 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 really glad that you guys are enjoying this, and also thanks for sending in a, a super chat. So earlier on in the stream, John, uh, John Van Van Divier, sorry, sorry, I'm. Com probably butchering your name. You've, uh, you've sent in another question. I've got it pulled up here. I'll ask it after this one. He says, does having a hundred plus arguments matter is crying out for the response? No, because we need to count arguments contra as well. So that he asked this earlier in the stream before we talked about, you know, we basically had on the screen four different strong arguments and then we lowered it down to two. If you've got two good arguments for naturalism. So he asked this question before we, we did that, but do you have any other thoughts or it, it, yeah. Anything else to say about this this question? Because I think it's really important. Yeah. You, no, that's exactly right. I mean, you have to be even-handed. One way to think about the likelihood framework is just think, okay, well, what's the total number of arguments, right? Um, if they're if they're relatively, you know, equal in terms of you know 
one points up this direction and the other point that down that direction, you know, both to the same magnitude, right? Then you can play them off against each other, yeah. right? And then the the question is, okay, well, you know, at the end of the day, what are you left with? You know, you can just count all there and say, you know, we've got a hundred over here, we've got a hundred over there, we've got, you know, and then just say, okay, well, that's in effect zero, <laughs> right? Or we've got a hundred over here and we've got 50 over here. So, you know, cumulative effect is 50. And that's why it's also important to establish independence. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because so I'll, I'll, I'll iterate that one more time because so if you've got, I mean, a lot of philosophers have argued that the, the, the problem of divine hiddenness, for example, is just an iteration of the problem of evil. So if you like, basically what you'd be doing in that case is you wouldn't have two arguments. You'd have one argument that would maybe be a little bit stronger because you're adding these two together. So the likelihood ratio, once you actually factor in these two types of evidence, which are not independent, they're, they're together. But once you factor those in together, your likelihood ratio would just go up a little bit. So, or however yeah. much you think it does. So that's important though, because when we're, we're talking about, you know, how many arguments there are. Uh, I, I know that, Ted, I know you didn't go and look through all of the different arguments that we did in our stream, but uh, maybe Chad, you can help him out with, uh, let's talk about the independence of these different arguments that we discussed in this longer stream. And how many do you think realistically, how many independent arguments for theism do you think realistically there are versus how many arguments realistically there are for for naturalism yeah i mean does having a hundred plus arguments matter like ted said uh it might matter it might not depends on how many arguments there are on the other side and it depends on the weight of those arguments uh the weight of the arguments on both sides um that's I important. Don't know I'm, to... I don't, I'm sorry about cutting you off but it, i yeah. think that's really important to emphasize because what we've been assuming and let me pull it back up on the screen what we've been assuming over here is that the likelihood ratio is 3.1 for each of these arguments, but that's not necessarily going to be the case. So when you actually right. do the calculation for the, so you gave the example, Ted, of the fine tuning argument. And I mean, I'm, I'm of the persuasion that that is a very strong argument for theism. So my likelihood ratio for that one would be a whole lot higher than 3.1. And someone, you know, a naturalist or an atheist, someone like Paul Draper he would think that the problem of evil is a whole lot stronger than 3.1. Yeah. So I just wanted to to emphasize, I, you just basically said that, Chad. Now, yeah. I just wanted to kind of show how that works, is that we're yeah. just using these, it, this, is a, it, this is a heuristic. This is, we're just putting these figures in right. just to give you some idea of how, how this would look, but that's not necessarily how it's actually going to play out once you get some, some more uh, definitive numbers. That's right. And and as far as de determining independence, I don't know how to determine independence. I don't, I, there probably isn't a fast and easy way to do that. Determine in, independence. I mean, how do you in, determine independence between 150 arguments? Uh, I, I don't know. But I, I will say this. Um, I mean, this is, this is a topic ripe for philosophical exploration. And if I had the, the chops, I would do it. Uh, but you know who does have the chops is Tim McGrew. And mm. he, he tells me that uh, maybe the criteria of of independence is overrated. He thinks that there's a way to do a cumulative case style of of argument that doesn't even rely on independence. That you there's a way to do it. The math is more complicated, but there's a way to do a cumulative cumulative case style arguments with dependent arguments. Uh, so that that might be something worth bringing on Tim in the future to discuss. Yeah, that, hmm. yeah, that's Ted, exactly what are your right. thoughts? I mean, um, yeah, that's exactly well, right. Well, I, I, mean, I would, I'd like to get your thoughts on the question that I asked earlier, which uh, w was basically just that, realistically, how many independent arguments do you think there are for theism versus how many independent arguments there are for, for naturalism? Which yeah, is so, ballpark. <laughs> ballpark. I'm working on uh, that issue now, actually. So, so you know, I'm writing Sounds like book. a simple question. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, um, how many how many arguments right meet these independence condition, um, and you know, you know, honestly, like, I mean, I don't want to give a number because I still haven't figured it all out. But, yeah. Um, well, we know there are at least two for theism. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I, I from from consciousness and then from like. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to give it just some examples, like of the issues I'm working working with is um 
you know, if you think about like a Bayesian version of the cosmological argument and a Bayesian version of the fine tuning argument, right? One of the things that Swinburne does in his approach is you, if you go back and look at the values that he's citing, he says, well, look, you know, a, a perfect being would want to bring about, you know, uh, a world, right, where you can have embodied rational agents, right? And so this increases the probability, right, that, you know, a world's going to exist, right, over, you know, um, say, you know, just a simple form of naturalism. But then when you get to the fine-tuning argument, you get the same sort of appeal, right? You say, well, you know, God's going to want to bring about this sort of world, right? And that strikes me as, you know, threatening, you know, the independence condition because you're thinking, well, you know, how probable is it, right, that you'd have the existence of the world and it would be fine-tuned, right? Um, you think, well, look, you know, if, if the world exists and it's fine-tuned, then clearly the world exists, Right. So it strikes me that those two considerations aren't um, independent, right? And so you think, okay, well, just pick one, right? And the cool thing about, you know, the kind of considerations that, uh, you know, I bring in the book and that Swinburne, you know, brings is that uh, you don't really lose anything uh, by picking one because all the considerations um, that favor, you know, sort of the cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, right, are going to carry over. Right to but to whichever one you pick. Um, another way to see this is like, you know, the argument um, uh, from consciousness and you know the ar argument um, from moral awareness, right? And you might think that those right um, aren't independent for some of the similar reasons, right? And so you might think, okay, well we end up with, you know, maybe you know two, three, four, five. Um, arguments that meet this independence condition, but it turns out that they're all really strong arguments. And then you do the same thing for naturalism and you think, okay, well, what are the arguments there? And as you mentioned, you know, um, you might think that evil and hiddenness, right, aren't uh, independent. So they're not two separate arguments, um, you know, and so I, you know, I'm kind of thinking at the end of the day, you know, uh, we'll end up with, um, um, you know, somewhere around like five uh, independent arguments, but in a way, this is this is also just a framework, you know. So um, I'm I'm happy for uh, people to you know, disagree and say no, there are more than that, or those you know less than that. So. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so here's a follow up question that John had. I don't know if it's a follow up, but uh, it, it was a good question. Is it possible to show the following claim is unreasonable? Quote: There are no strong arguments for theism. So he wants to know if if we can show that that's unreasonable to say that. Well, sure. I mean, you can define what a strong argument is, right? And you can say a strong argument is one that has a has a, a relatively strong likelihood ratio, right? And then you can just, you know, work through particular, you know, cases. And, um, you know, I th think fine-tuning, you know, people realize this is a strong argument for theism. If you take strong to mean right, has a significant likelihood ratio of favoring theism over atheism. Yeah, and I want to point out, uh, Chad, you may even, <laughs> about the, you may be about to say what I'm about to say here, is that, so you can grant, so if the, the theist can grant there are strong arguments for atheism, the atheist can grant that there are strong arguments for, for theism, that doesn't necessarily, and that goes back, I guess, to the distinction that, that Swinburne makes, is that you get have an argument that raises the probability of some hypothesis, but that doesn't necessarily raise the overall probability of that hypothesis such that it's greater than 0.5. So the atheist can say, okay, yeah, there are some strong arguments for theism, but nevertheless, I still think that the evidence, you know, favors atheism and the theist can do the same thing. So I think that's important to keep in mind as we're working through these different arguments and trying to, to weigh them together is that there's, I, I know just in me bias and everything like makes me want to disallow the possibility that there's any evidence against theism. Like, I don't want there to be a really good, strong argument for atheism because I'm a theist. So I feel that pull, but I want to just emphasize that you can you can allow that. It doesn't necessarily mean or follow that theism is false or that if you're an atheist, that atheism is false. I think that's important because we want to really try to assess these arguments objectively as opposed to just like going with our gut instinct and following that. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, uh, one point I want to make is that I think we can reductio this. Uh, um, let's, let's do it like this. Um, if there are no strong arguments for theism, then there are no strong arguments for any philosophical position. 
but there are strong arguments for some philosophical positions. So it's not the case that there are no strong philosophical arguments for theism. Well, one thing that has impressed me, uh, I mean, just as a as someone who's spent, um, you know, 20 years now uh, almost uh, looking at philosophy is there are relatively few strong, indisputably strong arguments in philosophy. Um, and uh the arguments for theism are about as strong as an any argument for a philo philosophical position could get. Uh, you know, whether you're arguing for the existence of numbers, whether you're arguing for a certain theory of knowledge, whether you're arguing for it doesn't matter. Uh, this is just this is just standard fare as far as standards for, for good philosophical arguments go. So what I found, though, is that Oh, when we're in the ontology room, when we're doing metaphysics and ontology, talking about whether sets exist, the standards for a good argument are way down here. <laughs> but all, all of a sudden, uh, the next classroom in philosophy of religion, the standard for a good argument for God's existence all of a sudden goes way up here. Uh, and so I think we need to treat all of these arguments uh, fairly and, and recognize that Look, theism's got arguments just as strong as any argument for any philosophical position. Amen. All right, here's a question from Cy Gart. And uh, Cy is actually speaking at our conference that we have coming up at the end of August. So he's a, uh, well, I'll just say that you want to come hear him speak. He's awesome. Okay, here's this question. From my, exper from my own experience, I always thought that the probability that God exists, if it's greater than zero that's sufficient to warrant belief or to allow for acceptance of personal experiences as additional evidence. What are your thoughts? Well, greater than zero uh, allows for a lot of room uh, that's less than, you know, uh, a half. And so I, I would just, you know, um, be concerned that, you know, suppose you think the probability that God exists is, you know, uh, uh, 0.1. Right. Then you think that the probability that there's no God, right, is uh, 0.9. Right. So you think it's much more probable, right, that there's, um, you know, no God than that there's a God. And in that condition, it can be difficult to see how that's a you know, how, how you would be accurately described as saying, I believe, right, that there's a God. Because, you know, if someone were to ask you, well, you know, do you think there's a God? And you think, no, I think more likely than not, there's no God. Um, now, now, uh, it can be like, if you're thinking about it in the framework of inquiry, right? Um, suppose you start off thinking that, you know, there might be uh, a madman in the building, right? So, uh, probability of say, you know, uh, something less than, uh, you know, greater than zero, that there's a madman in the, in the building. In that case, it makes sense to, uh, go investigate. Right. And gather more evidence to make sure that you're going to be OK. Right. And so, so, you know, a lot of people have had the thought is that, well, you know, if you're thinking about this along, you know, a, along the dimension of like grow, growing and develop, you know, if you think that, you know, there might be a God, then, you know, it definitely makes sense to, you know, go inquire. Right. And, and see if you can turn up more evidence. So <clears throat> I interviewed Dr. Liz Jackson of, on the topic of faith, and this kind of came up, and so I, I wanted to just give an example that she gave that was really interesting to think about, and I, I don't really have any settled thoughts on it, but um, so so here's basically the case. So imagine uh, a mother who, she, she's got a son, but the son was in some kind of accident. Maybe they were uh, in some building that collapsed, and so you don't know the state of the son, if like he's still alive or what. So, but nevertheless, you know, the, the evidence that this building collapsed, she hasn't heard from him, uh, that may lower the probability that he exists. Nevertheless, she's probably going to maintain her belief that he does exist and hope that he's alive, even have faith that he's alive. So I think that that shows if you, well, if you think that's a good case, I guess just think about it more. Um, it shows that you can be rational in thinking that, you know, some proposition is unlikely, but nevertheless maintain belief and faith in that, you know, in that proposition. So something to think about. Yeah, I think a, a great paper that explores exactly such cases and concludes that belief in God is rational on such grounds is uh, Richard Creel's paper, uh, Agatheism, A Justification of Rationality of Devotion to God. So check that out if you're interested in such cases. Nice. Such a good resource to have, Chad. Okay. 
Uh, did you have something else to add, Ted? No. No? Okay. Uh, so from Tommy S., he's one of our moderators. He's, uh, I believe, is agnostic. Is, he says, is it assumed that theism and naturalism have equal prior probabilities? If so, why? Yeah, so so I do argue for that in the paper, and I'd maybe point you to you know, that discussion. Um, so the argument basically is that uh, if we use explanatory reasoning to determine what are the plausible grand theories, we end up with a limited number of grand theories of the universe, and the paper argued for three, right? And then I argue that since in this case we have no reason uh, from prior probabilities to, um, you know, to um, give one more probability than the other, then we should um, assign them equal probability, right? So that would be an application of a limited form of the principle of indifference, you know, and, you know, there are objections to the principle of indifference when you don't know uh, about, you know, the relevant space. But I think in this case, we do know enough about the relevant space to distribute probability evenly over those. And so you do get, you know, um, the uh, conclusion that in this case, theism and naturalism do have the same uh, prior probability. So then when we had the calculator up, I'll just pull it up one more time. I mean, I, to me, this seems like a really good place to start because suppose that, you know, as we were doing earlier, how we started out with four arguments here and then, you know, that updates the numbers. And then we said, well, maybe there's two arguments for atheism that we think are strong. So then we just lower this down. So I think that's a, a really even handed way of doing it because if you keep the probability, the, the starting probability that God exists at 0.5, then you can just uh, mess with the numbers this way, or you could do it this way. You could say, um, you know, what are two arguments for, so at 0 0.9, so 1 minus 0 0.9 would be 0 0.1, so you could do your starting probability at 0 0.1, and then say you've got four arguments for God, and you'd basically wind up at around the same number. So you could do it that way, it's just a different way. I mean, you're plugging in these numbers somewhere in your equation, so it's still going to come out with the, the total probability being around the same. So it, I think this is just an easier way of doing it, is just starting with the 0 0.5, and then figuring out how the arguments sort of even out or if they, you know, how they, how they weigh, I think that's a good way of doing it. Any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, one complicating factor in this is, is the ontological argument, or, or if you think that it's true that either God exists necessarily or God's existence is impossible, that's going to, that's going to screw our probability equations up. Uh, Ted, I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it's kind of an assumption of this um, way of approaching, uh, you know, uh, the confirmation of theism that you're not giving unit probability to either God exists or God doesn't exist, right? So it's somewhere, uh, you know, between uh, zero and one. You know, another thing I think is really important to, to sort of point out, um, as Cameron was doing, is that, you know, you can, the cool thing about this framework is that, you know, you think, okay, well, you know, we're being too generous with the probability, you know, the prior probability that God exists. It's like, okay, well, in that case, just lower it. And what you mm -hmm. see up here on the screen right now is, you you know, you went from 0.5 to 0.1, right? And even in the assumption that you've got just four arguments that have relatively um, um, uh, good strength, and this, uh, just remember the likelihood ratio of three is going to be less than the selection of two white balls. So it's going to be like, you know, a selection of like a white ball and then kind of like a peak, you know, of a little uh, white ball. That's how we're thinking about the arguments in the in this case. Um, Look at how much it goes up with just 10 medium arguments. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we're, we're using really conservative likelihood ratios as well. So you can play with those too and see how that affects things. So if we took mm -hmm. this back down to zero, throw the likelihood ratio up to eight. Look at that. Yeah. And we could even put this lower. We could put it point zero zero one. Yep. Yep. And still. Yeah. And I, you know, I think this uh, discussion has been really helpful for people realizing like it's these are just numbers, right? So it's really important to understand what the numbers are representing. And that's why the uh, urn case is uh, important because you can see, right, the numbers are just tracking in a way how many uh, white balls are selected, right, in this specific case. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit too much fun with these numbers. Yeah, you, you can. Uh, it's crazy.
Yeah, no, you can totally... <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so this... Okay, equivalent white balls, 19 in a row. Yeah. I thought I thought that's what this number was. I was like, hang on a second. Something's gone wrong here. No, that's also, the, yeah, the total likelihood ratio. Yeah, and let, let me say that, uh, you know, as my wife tells me, you know, when she's consulting these... Uh, these articles in, in the medical field, a likelihood ratio of 10 is uncommonly strong for a diagnosis. And some of the articles that she sent me, they're routinely making diagnoses based on likelihood ratios as low as um, one and two. So, uh, I mean, if we have a like likelihood ratio above even one and two, I mean, we're already doing better than most doctors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the mammogram case, you know, remember in that case, the likelihood ratio is nine, right? And that's a that's a case where you think, you know, yeah, it's pretty powerful evidence. Yeah. Um, but it is really important to take the priors into consideration. Yes. All right, let's go back to the, uh, the questions. We've only got a couple more and then we'll close out the stream. Okay, so one of the objections we got earlier on was from Matt Rut Rutter. I believe he's an atheist. He says one of the objections. That's the only objection. Theism is totally implausible. Any I'm thoughts, not sure comments? What comment, what comment is he responding to? I don't remember. I think I was asking the audience. This is when I was asking the audience for questions or objections to oh. to address. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I believe yeah, this, you was, can think, this was. You could think about, you know, okay, so do you think science is plausible? Why is science plausible? Why are scientific theories plausible? And you think, well, because they, um, you know, have these features, they explain a lot. They don't posit brute limits. Uh, they, you know, try to account for phenomena in terms of relatively, you know, few um, assumptions in a way that leaves as many, uh, leaves few unanswered questions, right? And if you, if you think, you know, along those lines, then, you know, you just have to be even handed with, you know, your ways of approaching these theories. And, you know, if that's uh, your criteria for the plausibility of a theory, then um, theism is going to uh, count as a plausible uh, theory. You know, of course, there are a lot of varieties of theism. And, you know, uh, if you think that God somehow or another is like a flying spaghetti monster, right, mm -hmm. then you're going to be like, yeah, that's incredibly um, um, implausible. But that's just not the way to understand what theism is. Any, any last thoughts, Chad? Actually, I think uh, we'll go ahead and close it out. I had another question, but it was a little bit too off topic. So uh, just any kind of concluding thoughts for the for the stream today? Uh, let me do one thought by Ted. Actually, a, Chad, because you're, you're, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. So let's do uh, let's do okay. Ted's first and then we'll come okay, back sure. to it. I think I think your connection should clear up by then. So Ted, I know you just sure. uh you just kind of answered that question, but any anything else that you'd like to say about just what we've talked about, any last things to keep in mind and yeah. Yeah, well, I hope the framework that uh you know, we presented is really helpful. I mean, like I've stressed um, you know, before and I just keep on stressing this is it's a very flexible framework. Right? So it's almost like I think of it as as uh you know, using a microscope, right? When we began to use microscopes, we discovered things that we didn't know before because we had much more powerful tools, right? And I think of, you know, the probability calculus as a powerful tool for, um, you know, making progress in some of these issues that in the past we've had to rely on, you know, intuition and argument. And now we can, you know, model these things. And so uh, it's a very flexible and powerful framework. And I'd encourage people to, to you know, do the numbers yourselves. I mean, maybe... Um, you know, I'll put on a website or something just how to uh, make your own calculator, right? And then, you know, it would be great to see, you know, what you came up with. I think it's also really important to to actually do something like this because as you talked about earlier with the mammogram case is that a lot of like our intuitions about probability are often fallible. So it's good to like actually put in some work and figure out how all these things are interacting because sometimes, yeah, you know, we, it's we not may just think that, that they're, they're fallible. Yeah, it's not just that they're fallible and sometimes mistaken. They're horrendous. Like people are just <laughs> not good. <laughs> and that goes for everybody. They're just not good at calculating probabilities. Chad, any last thoughts? Yeah, hopefully I'm coming through. Uh, one one pause or, or, or reason for caution about this calculator is 
is this is that you know you might think that if theism is true then we have reason to expect a theistically in universe since presumably a loving god would 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 be interested in a genuine uncompelled relationship so uh i think it was pascal who said that there's enough evidence for those with an open mind and heart to see but not enough to compel belief in those that don't so the fact that we're being challenged to come up with a scenario where theism isn't confirmed uh is something going wrong here because uh god would not want it to be as easy as it seems to be so uh, i wonder i wonder if ted has a closing thought about that yeah we have very powerful evidence for uh lots of things that uh, people don't properly act on so I'm thinking of the recent, you know, <laughs> epidemiological facts about the, you know, powers of, you know, vaccines, you know, to uh, prevent diseases. And this is something that is just well known. Right. And yet, um, you know, it's it's you know difficult to um, act on that or, you know, America has an obsession with alcohol. But we know that, you know, alcohol is extremely bad for the human body. Uh, mm. This <laughs> Everyone's aware of this, but, you know, I mean, it's one of the leading industries. So, you know, I'd temper that a little bit and just say, you know, there can be a, a sort of cognitive dissonance, you know, between things that you know that are, that are true, right? But, you know, this other part of us that um, doesn't want to, you know, um, engage with those truths. Hmm. Good point. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today. I hope you got something out of this. Let me know if you've got any questions or objections in the comments. And if we get uh, some really good objections, we may do a round two or a part two or answer some of those. So who knows? But thank you uh, both Chad and Ted for coming back on. It was, uh, it was a blast. I learned some things. I, I actually really enjoyed messing around with this calculator and stuff. So it was a lot of fun. So uh, until the next video, we'll see you guys later. Right, thanks. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?